I've been a photojournalist for over 20 years. In that time, I've covered sports, uh, like youth soccer in impoverished Parisian suburbs. Uh, Stefano Tsitsipas making it to his first Grand Slam final. And I've even covered some borderline sports, like the cigar smoking world championships. <laughs> I covered Hurricane Katrina and protests from Romania to Paris to the steps of the US Capitol. I covered the pandemic. And with the so support of the National Geographic Foundation, I found out that COVID can affect even our furriest friends. And last year, I spent five months covering Russia's invasion of Ukraine. What I've rarely done, though, as maybe you can tell, is stand on a stage in front of a crowd like this to talk about my work. It's a privilege to be with you today and to share the moments behind the moments, but it's also a challenge. When David invited me to speak, he told me to just talk about my career. But all things being equal, I'd much rather be taking pictures than tracing my career from its beginning and thinking about my work and what it means and why I do it. To understand what brought me to this stage, though, we need to go all the way back to when I was in high school, making black and white photos like these. and the day that I entered a National High School Photographer of the Year contest. I submitted nine prints to this contest from what I think of as my Cartier-Bresson impression phase. And to my shock, I won the contest. The prize was a coveted spot uh, at the 16th annual Eddie Adams Workshop, which uh, David mentioned, and uh, they had a, a talk earlier today. You can visit them at the Partner Pavilion. Um, and as David mentioned, if you look up Eddie Adams, he's most famous for his photo of the uh, general executing a Viet Cong on the streets of Saigon. But to young photographers, his name more immediately evokes the workshop that he founded an opportunity for early career photojournalists to meet editors and rub soldier, sh shoulders with legends of the field. I got to meet some of my photographic heroes there, including, including Eddie himself, who when I was introduced sort of gruffly grunted hello and then suggested we take a photo with all the Pulitzer Prize winners who were there. So as you can see, just eight clearly equally experienced photographers. <laughs> Whether he intended it or not, uh, David gave me a rather daunting project today. I tend to just go from assignment to assignment, project to project, and tear sheet to tear sheet. But I realized in putting together this series of photos that there are a few constants to how I work. You could call them contradictions, or dichotomies, or just tensions. Maybe they're just weird voices in my head. And some of them I'm always aware of, and some of them I've only noticed looking back now. But for better or for worse, they define my approach to photography and to journalism. When I first started working at newspapers, I was the lowest person on the totem pole, and I often got the assignments that no one wanted to do. I took this photo, please hold your applause, <laughs> for the Durham Herald Sun's What's Broken column. This feature highlighted things like potholes and derelict buildings. Try not to fall asleep while I read the thrilling caption I wrote for this photo. The house at 2114 Ash Street in Durham has been classified as a priority, which indicates it is a hazard to the community. I know. But I searched for ways to make assignments like these more interesting. As I was making this photograph, I was accosted by a neighbor who was clearly disgruntled. He wanted to know exactly what I was doing, so I defensively explained the important assignment I was on. And then his face lit up, and he said, oh, you should see the inside. 
When I filed this photo, my editor said, Pete, this is amazing. This is the best photo anybody's ever taken for a what's broken assignment. And then he said, but we can never publish it because you were trespassing. <laughs> Go figure. Since that first newspaper internship, I've looked for moments. A marine widow grieving her fallen husband. Or a non-denominational church service. This was taken for a college class where we had to find and photograph a story every week. And by that point, I'd run out of good ideas. A classmate of mine, taking pity on me, threw me a bone. He was like, okay, look, man, my barber is also a pastor. What he didn't tell me was that this particular pastor barber oversaw a congregation of believers who spoke in tongues and frequently fainted to the ground. Sometimes in the course of the most mundane, boring-sounding stories, you meet the most extraordinary people. I found moments at Little League games. And after moving to San Francisco in 2011 at Major League games. Hopefully there's no Cardinal fans here. Uh, this is the Giants tying the 2020, 2012 in LCS. I found a job at a newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle, as a photo editor, producer, and occasional photographer. I was able to shoot small assignments on the side here and there, like a fluffy weekly column about the hills of San Francisco. It featured valets outside a mansion in Pacific Heights, and a group of friends making breakfast out of their VW bus atop Twin Peaks. I did travel assignments, like whale watching from a kayak in Half Moon Bay. In many ways, my setup at the Chronicle was ideal. It was a dream job. I got to live in San Francisco, which is still one of my favorite cities in the world. And I had the st stability of a weekly paycheck. But throughout my time in San Francisco, I was also photo editing the wires and the biggest international stories of that time, like the Arab Spring, the war in Afghanistan, and the revolution in Ukraine. I started to spend a lot of time wondering what it was like to report on conflict and to photograph people in crisis. So I left the Chronicle and moved overseas. I photographed the 2015 refugee crisis as over a million displaced people and asylum seekers flooded into Europe, fleeing wars in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Men, women, and children brought only what they could carry, and I documented these possessions with a series of portraits made in Greece. Phones and jewelry were, of course, common, as were thumb drives containing cherished photos and wrapped in a balloon to stay dry. Ibrahim Koja from Aleppo carried a copy of the Quran, while 13-year-old Jean Ali brought an umbrella and her hair straightener. <laughs> the route was perilous. Jafar Suleiman from Raqqa lost his belongings in the sea crossing from Turkey. I followed the story across the continent from Hungary to Serbia to Croatia to Slovenia to Austria benefiting from the generosity of colleagues on staff at various publications by riding in their cars and sleeping on their hotel room floors. Initially, I thought, as maybe every young photographer does, that in the midst of a refugee crisis or conflict, I wouldn't be struggling to make compelling images, that it would be easy to make images that would inform and inspire empathy in people halfway around the world. But I quickly learned I was wrong about that equation. Everything that was happening around me was urgent and emotional. Sometimes it was violent and frighteningly chaotic. The process of how to make those photos was entirely new, and I wasn't prepared for the challenges of how to do my work and to do it well. The challenge wasn't about making the mundane interesting as it had been in San Francisco, 
The challenge was how to stay warm in a muddy field and how to avoid getting arrested by the Hungarian border police. As a photographer, the challenge is to deal with a myriad of language barriers, cars breaking down, and the jerks from the TV crews who've booked all the hotel rooms. So I mentioned earlier that there are these tensions or dichotomies that I come across. Communication barriers often lead to absurd moments. When I first arrived on this story, I'd previously been whining about not knowing how to get there, whether I would find work uh, or people to travel with. So a colleague of mine, just sort of out of exasperation, bought me a bus ticket to Budapest, kind of called my bluff. From there, I took a train to the Serbian border, and as I arrived, a friend from the Irish Times called, Irish Times called me, and he said, Pete, you have to get down here. There's tear gas everywhere. So I told the hotel receptionist, uh, I need a car. Can you call me a car? Um, because I need to get to the border, ASAP. And I tried to sound really important as I said this um, to impress upon her how urgent it was. It must have worked because a few minutes later, a gold limousine pulled up to drive me to this riot. Most juxtapositions aren't that stark. But there's something profound in sharing moments of joy amidst the desperate and unimaginably difficult struggle that these people endured in search of a better life. I always try to make at least one image that communicates that. This is Walter on the right, an Austrian artist who brought a drum to the Vienna train station. And for an afternoon, everyone danced and sang and forgot for a moment the odyssey that they were on. A year later, in October of 2016, many of these refugees ended up in the jungle, a sprawling shanty town near Calais. The population had swelled into the thousands. I spent a week documenting the chaos as French authorities began to evict and demolish the camp. Fires started breaking out. As soon as firefighters extinguished one blaze, another would pop up. In tense situations like this one, my colleagues and I typically work in groups for safety. But in trying to get to this fire quickly, we got separated. All alone, I took this photo. Whenever I can, I get permission to photograph people, not because I have to, but because my images are better when the people I'm photographing understand what it is I'm doing. I think of my subjects almost as collaborators. But in breaking news and dynamic moments like this one, that sort of dialogue just isn't possible. So a split second after I made this photo, this guy locked eyes with me, grabbed me, and threw me into the wall of the shack behind me. Given that reaction, I suspect that he might have had something to do with the fire exploding behind him, but I'm not sure about that. My first rule in confrontations like this is not to let the other person dictate the tenor of the conversation. Just because you're being yelled at doesn't mean you have to yell back. After a few seconds of calmly speaking to him, he let me go. This type of work takes a toll. I found I couldn't spend all my time putting myself in physical danger and absorbing the emotions of traumatized people. That's why I do these kinds of stories in rotation. We all need to decompress. So I started working, somewhat by accident, for the sports desk at the New York Times, and I photographed long reported features. I wasn't photographing the Super Bowl or the World Series. Rather, I photographed the world's oldest basketball court, which happens to be in a Paris basement. I looked at the effects of climate change on an annual ice skating race that had to be relocated from the Netherlands to Austria because of the warming climate. This man fell flat on his face in front of me. He'd been skating for hundreds of kilometers at that point. He touched his mouth, glanced down at the ice, and then looked up to me. Is one out, he asked in broken English. I wasn't sure what to tell him. I documented a Georgian village's annual all-town, no-rules rugby match. 
Now, some of these stories are the result of hours of meticulous research. Sometimes you start with a sport or event that seems interesting, like San Fermin, but it takes time to tease an interesting angle out of it. In this case, though, I saw a Facebook post from an acquaintance. It read, a man came into my hospital room to see if I wanted to get the bull that gored me taxidermied. I could have its head mounted on my wall for a cool 1,200 euros. I mean, that's basically the whole pitch right there. It has a beginning, middle, and an end. It's perfect. So yeah, it turns out there's a guy who taxidermies all the bulls after the running and the bullfights in Pamplona. So just a little warning, if anyone's squeamish, the next photo you might want to look away for. I shared this on my Instagram, and a colleague commented that it was beautiful. In response, another commenter told her she was sick to think that. And this is actually gratifying to elicit such opposing but equally potent reactions, for some people to see beauty and others to feel disgust. In aiming to objectively portray a range of subjects and viewpoints, provoking opposing reactions is the highest compliment. But of all the moments I've photographed and places I've seen, Ukraine is the one that keeps pulling me back. If you look at my Instagram, you'll see my last non-Ukraine post. It's from January 8th, 2022. The last 50 images are from Ukraine. You might conclude from that number that clients are always clamoring to send me to Ukraine. In fact, the countless trips I've made, including when I moved to Kyiv, I've paid my own way almost every time. The longer I go in my career, the more I find that the images I want to make aren't always the images that people want to hire me for. I first went to Ukraine from San Francisco at the beginning of 2015. I ended up moving there for two years. Ironically, a century earlier, it's where my ancestors had immigrated from. The Maidan revolution was two years over at that point. But there was still fierce fighting in the east. Nevertheless, I found tender moments at the front. This is Volodya, a volunteer soldier who had escorted me to the contact line, where I could see the so-called separatist positions less than 300 meters away. When we pulled up, a shot whistled over our heads, and I hit the deck. Volodya, still standing, looked at me bemusedly. They're just saying hello. He shrugged. As you can see, while I was being worried about being shot at, Volodya found time to pick flowers for his wife, who was visiting his base for the weekend. I went to the first of what would be many soldiers' funerals, and I got so wrapped up in photographing this moment that I didn't notice Mikhail Saakashvili, the former president of Georgia, standing at the center of the frame. I tried to make photos that spoke not only to soldiers' physical, but also their psychological trauma as they practiced yoga in a peaceful countryside. When the front lines and the conflict froze a few months later, I looked for cultural stories throughout the country, like a singing group in Western Ukraine, or a man celebrating epiphany in the frozen Dnieper River. I traveled to the shores of Mariupol, where I photographed children enjoying idyllic summers with no inkling that the city would be largely destroyed eight years later. And I tried to capture the natural beauty of this country that's so little known to Americans and so little known to the West. And I documented the ascendance of a young television star to the presidency.
In stories as big as this one, it's impossible to cover everything, least of all in one photo. As photojournalists, we're often just looking for a sliver of access, an unexpected moment, or a cracked door that we can creep through to find a visual metaphor that takes a micro moment and speaks to the macro situation. Eventually, news interest in Ukraine waned, and commissions for cultural stories were few and far between. I moved to Paris, and then, during the pandemic, back to the US. But at the end of 2021, when the rumblings that Putin was going to invade again grew loud, I made the decision to return. No one knew what would happen, of course, but I felt a profound calling to go, one that was hard to explain to my friends and family. I got to Kiev in January, and if I'm being honest, I spent a lot of time second-guessing myself and wondering if I'd miscalculated the timing and the urgency of that feeling. I watched the country ready itself all the same. Volunteer soldiers trained with mock rifles. And weapons arrived from the West. And 21-year-old soldier Andre worked to deep in a trench where weeks earlier his comrade had been killed by a sniper. And then everything changed. At dawn on February 24th of last year, I was in my hotel room at the Hotel Kramatorsk in eastern Ukraine, about 60 miles from Russian-held Donetsk. Ukraine had just closed its airspace to civilian flights, and any plane already en route was turning around. The security team at BuzzFeed News, the outlet I was working for at the time, told us to get some sleep because the invasion was probably imminent. I like to think I'm somewhat seasoned at this point, but those directives were sort of incompatible. So I was awake and lying on my bed when my room was illuminated by a bright flash of light. It felt like it lasted forever, but just a few seconds later, the sound and the shockwave of the cruise missiles rocked the building. The invasion had started. I had been sleeping for the previous few nights with all my bags packed, so I grabbed them and ran down to the makeshift bomb shelter, which was the basement of our hotel. I was surprised, given that the hotel was full of journalists, to be the first one down there. But I remember thinking, well, mom will be happy about this. So what do you photograph when the largest country on Earth suddenly invades the country you're in? I started with what was in front of me. This is my hotel basement, and those are my colleagues. My team and I thought that we were well prepared for what was going to happen. We had equipment, some gas, a bit of food, but a four-pronged, full-scale invasion was more than we had anticipated. We had thought the East would be a good place to report on the war, but now it seemed like a terrible mistake. Eventually, we ventured outside, and I found a lone pedestrian crossing the street in front of an armored vehicle. With Russian forces sprinting towards the capital, it seemed like they might beat us to Kyiv, or worse, that we might get encircled by Russia's military and therefore cut off from the rest of the country and we might end up somehow as impromptu residents of Russia. We decided to drive the 450 miles back to Kyiv. We saw smoke in the sky and guessed at whether it was from bombardments or from factories. We saw long lines of cars waiting for gas. We stopped for food and watched the news with the sole other patron of the restaurant. and we arrived in Kyiv in nightfall, moments before the curfew. On darkened highways, digital billboards that normally show garish advertisements instead quietly display the animated U Ukrainian flags. I wondered if this would be one of the last times that I saw Kyiv, and it was haunting. We spent another sleepless night in another hotel basement, this time in the parking garage of the Radisson. Kiev was deserted, 
With reports of fighting on the streets of the northern neighborhoods, we decided to leave the city for the safety of the outskirts. Moments after I took this photo, we passed a little grocery store. My God, it's open, I remarked to one of my colleagues. I ducked in and asked for non-perishable food like granola bars or dried fruit. And the clerk gave me a concerned look and asked me if I was gluten-free. <laughs> On the streets, plainclothes young men formed militias as combat air patrols screamed overhead. We joined the thousands fleeing the city to retreat to a house south of town. People fled by any means necessary. They fled by train. They fled over destroyed bridges. And they fled in the arms of their compatriots. I documented soldiers fighting for their country, training in the snow outside of Kyiv or on patrol near Kharkiv. I attended meals with them, and I saw anti-tank missiles secreted in a Kiev pizzeria. In the fear and confusion of the early days, suspected collaborators were detained at checkpoints with packing tape. I found cities devastated by fighting, and villages bidding a final goodbye to their young men. Civilians were laid to rest during occupation with makeshift markers in the forest outside recently liberated Izum. They had to be painstakingly exhumed by Ukrainian investigators. And other civilians, like Valery Kot, weren't even afforded the dignity of a wooden cross in a desolate forest. He was buried in his yard by his neighbors during the occupation. Olga Kochenko had to bury her son in a similar fashion. She waited at the morgue for his remains while investigators finished their work. This was the country home of the Grisenko family. 11-year-old Anastasia was killed on September 17, 2022, when a missile obliterated the house outside of Kharkiv. Her parents were out volunteering to deliver food to the elderly. They'd taken her to the countryside because they hoped it would be safer than the city. A few days later, her neighbors gathered to pay their respects. I want to remember her as she was, smiling and laughing, not how I saw her yesterday after she had been thrown through two walls of a building, said Anastasia's father, Andriy. I want people to know that this baby was supposed to live. She did no evil to anyone. She was so young. I've just showed you a lot of awful moments, the stuff of nightmares, and I want you to look at them. But just like on the refugee trail, it's important to remember that even in war, there are moments of hope and levity, and that conflicts are not binary states. Kiev repelled the Russian blitzkrieg and continues to be free and beautiful. Young Ukrainians, ever resilient, organized dance parties to clean up shelled homes. while others disassembled discarded ease cigarettes 
and wire them into DIY power banks to donate to the military. The Kiev Ballet has reopened. And high school students, amidst Russian attacks on Ukrainian electrical infrastructure, use cell phone flashlights to complete their homework. Friends embrace on the disused train platform in Mykolaiv as the first train passes through on the way to liberated Kherson. And in the ruins of Urpin, which was the site of some of the worst atrocities of Russian occupation, seedlings grow in a melted planter. And Hasidim make their annual pilgrimage, a tradition that dates to the 1800s to Uman for Rosh Hashanah. I'd wanted to go to Uman since I first lived in Ukraine, and I wanted to do this story since almost as soon as the invasion started. Putin's stated reason for the invasion is the, quote, denazification of Ukraine. If Ukraine was suddenly so full of Nazis, I wondered, how is the tr this tradition continuing? Many of the people I spoke to were equally perplexed. Not only did they not know about any Nazis, but they were undaunted. One of them told me, we know what war is. In Israel, we have wars on and off all the time. So this is a photography conference, um, expo, trade show, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I framed my talk through my experience as a photographer. But if there's one thing I'd like you to take away from this, it's to empathize with the plight, the grief, and the struggle of those that I've documented. I owe my subjects a tremendous debt for their trust in me. And my other debt is to this community. I don't know what my career would look like, or where I would be, or if I'd even be a photographer if I hadn't gone to the Eddie Adams workshop two decades ago. What I do know is that I found a special bond in this community. Eddie invited me to be a part of this photo that I'll treasure forever. Chris Hondros got me the meeting that led to my job at the San Francisco Chronicle. When he was killed a few months later in Libya, a fellow freelancer insisted on picking me up at the airport in New York so that I wouldn't have to arrive to his memorial alone. When I first moved to Ukraine, colleagues helped me buy train tickets and showed me how to get the accreditations I needed. I've slept on colleagues' couches from DC to Maine, in Paris, and in Berlin, not to mention in Kiev and in Donetsk. I'm constantly trying to repay their kindness. Even as I was preparing this talk, I realized how uncomfortable it feels to use the first person to say I. My first instinct is to say we. Journalism is always a collaborative endeavor. Colleagues in the field, fixers and drivers, and not to mention our editors back in the office. I can't speak to whether or not other professions come with this kind of community and support. I've only ever been a photographer. I'm grateful for it. I feel that community now in this room with all of you. That contest that I won in high school, where I took this photo, that led to this moment here on this stage, B&H sponsored and organized it. Thank you. <laughs>